evening, everybody. Merry Christmas. Go ahead and stand with us, and we're going to start our evening by worship. the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yeah. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Shout out your praise, oh, 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 we shout out your praise, oh, 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 we sing to the God who heals, we sing to the God who saves, we sing to the God who always makes a way, cause he hung up on that cross, and he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. And we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. And we were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, oh. Let's pray this evening. Lord God, we shout for joy because of the birth of our Savior, Jesus Christ. We shout for joy because you sent him into the world to live perfectly, to die sacrificially, and to rise again in power. And God, we worship you for that. We celebrate because of that. We shout for joy because of that, because our salvation is found in what Christ has done. Father, thank you for that. We, we've gathered together tonight to celebrate all of those things, and I pray, Lord, that you are blessed, that you are worshiped well tonight by us. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. 
Christmas, everybody. It's good to see you. This is what you guys look like on a Saturday night. Okay. All right. I like it. Hey, go ahead and take a seat for a moment. Um, we are going to have a good time of worship tonight. It's, it's really good to see the people of God gathering outside of our normal time to make this evening special. We are at one of the two most giant Christian holidays of the year. This is a time to celebrate Jesus together as the people of God. Amen? So it's good to see you here. Um, I have a couple of quick things I want to let you know about. First, uh, kiddos, on your way in, you received a bag. There's all sorts of things to kind of do and stay occupied with during the sermon because when I start talking, I'm going to bore all of the children. I know that's how it goes. But kiddos, listen, there's actually a bingo game in there. And if you're listening to my words, if I say a word that's on that bingo sheet, you mark it. And when you get bingo, just let us all know, okay? You could say bingo. And this is the one time you'll be allowed to shout out during a service, and I will be happy, and that'll be okay, all right? Um, let's see, what else? I have, I have uh, instructions to give you for our candle lighting time, and I want to give them to you now because I feel like it would be very anticlimactic if in the middle of the moment I say, now here's how you do this, okay? So when, we, when it's time to light candles later, in order to not like spray hot wax on your neighbor and not get wax all over the chairs, when your candle is lit, you keep it straight, okay? Don't tip the lit candle. When you go to light your neighbor, have them tip to you. Huh? Isn't that genius? That's great. I love it. I'm the kind of person that needs that explanation. Many of you say, I knew that already, but there were five more people in this room like me, and you should be grateful they're not going to wax you, okay? That's awesome. Um, all right. I think that's everything I want to say. Anything else? I think at the end of the service, are there still, where is Elizabeth? 
There's boxes over there. Are we still doing uh, ornaments? What? You're shaking your head? Okay, never mind. Okay. All right. After <laughs> the, the staff clearly doesn't communicate very well. It's Christmas week. We've been busy. Uh, after you're, when, when you're making your way out, take your candle with you. There will be a box by the door. You can drop that in there. Um, this is going to be a good evening. Let me, let me uh, call up the Stition family or what, what is uh, remaining after that uh, collision over there. You guys okay? Great. Come on up. <laughs> They're going to do our Advent reading. Uh, go ahead and say hi to the Stitions with me. Hey, come on, kiddos. We're doing great. <laughs> all right, so uh, tonight we're going to light all of the candles. So we have our candles that we've been uh, lighting for the past several weeks, which are the four candles of the Advent season. And then tonight we also light the Christ candle. So with this candle we celebrate that Jesus is going to be born. Jesus is coming. Jesus is our salvation. Our reading is from Galatians chapter 4 verse 4, which says, <clears throat> When the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law. Let's pray. Great God of love and light, we thank you now for the light of that special star over 2,000 years ago that guided humble shepherds and learned wise men to the holy babe. Lead us now by the light of your love that we may also follow you to the new life in him. In celebration of the birthday of our King and our Savior, Jesus Christ, we pray, amen. Amen. Stand with me and we're going to sing a couple more songs. town of Bethlehem, how still we see the light above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by, yet in thy dark streets shall Yeah. 
listen to us, we pray. Cast out our sin and enter and be born in us today. We hear the Christmas angels, the great glad tidings tell. Oh, come to us, abide with us, our Lord Emmanuel. Away in a manger, no. lay down his sweet head the stars in the sky look down where he lay the little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay the cow Our, uh, our church kids, our KPW kids, if you want to go ahead and head over to where Miss Elizabeth is. If you're a visiting kid, you don't go over there. This says uh, our KPW kids are going to uh, sing a song for you here in a little bit. So they're going to get staged and prepped. Cool, cool, cool. And then uh, we have uh, done a video for uh, our kids. Some of our kids told the story and some of the adults acted foolish and acted it out. So enjoy this video and then the kids are gonna come sing for us. A long, 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 long time ago. The prophecy told that uh, a savior was coming to save the world from sin. Mary and Joseph were going to get married. And then an angel came and told Mary, don't be frightened. You will have a baby. You call him Jesus. He'll be the forever king. Ah, this isn't possible. I'm not married yet. Do not be afraid. I am like an angel of God. And God has chosen you to have the, the baby that will, that will be the Messiah, the Savior. Uh. She was engaged with a man named Joseph. Now, when Joseph heard Mary was pregnant, he was mad and was gonna cancel the wedding. But in his sleep, an angel told him God had sent the baby. And then a king ordered everyone to go back to their hometowns so that he could count the people in his kingdom. Mary and Joseph were heading to Bethlehem and she was about to have her baby 
they tried to find a hotel for him to sleep in. They all were saying, sorry, there's no room full, but I I think you should look over there for someone, but I'm but I'm really sorry. Uh we used everywhere. Like 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 everywhere. So you can come but you can sleep in the hallway. One finally said, we're all out, but you you can got you can go to the stable that is where Jesus is born. And on that very same day, night, hey, hey, some shepherds were watching over their sheep. Bop, 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 bop. When the same angel appeared to them and said, Do not be afraid, for I have come with great news. A new baby is born. I do us a child is born to so we can be forgiven for our sins. What is happening? They have eyes everywhere. Let's go see if they were telling the truth. So they ran there, leaving their sheep behind, behind with the wolves after them. So they went down to check it out. God was so excited. He put a big star up in the sky and three wise men so far away they saw it and they knew that a king was born. So all night they partied and then they grabbed their stuff and their camels and they were so far away it took a long time for them to get there. First they went to Herod's palace and say, where is the new king that was born? And Herod was like, I don't want there to be another king. I want to be the king. Go and find that king and tell me where he is so I shall worship, go and worship him too. They knew what, they were like super smart and they were like, well he is the savior. So they were bringing him gifts. I can give him a donkey stuffed animal. I would bring him like some gold and like air conditioning. Please take these gifts in honor and we praise your name. Uh, wow. Everyone stand with us and sing with the kids. Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plains, and the mountains in reply echo back their joyous strains. tidings be which inspire your heavenly song
Right. Uh, after that video and that performance, I think, uh, I don't know what I'm going to be able to do up here, so maybe we should just call it, move to the candles? No, all right, we'll turn to the Word of God. That's, that's a pretty good place to go, right, the Word of God? All right, good, good, good. So open your Bibles to Luke chapter 2, Merry Christmas again. Um, we're doing, uh, we're excited, we're doing real candles this year, so some of you are really stoked about that. And yeah, there's one, all right, real candles, that counts. All right, so um, one of the reasons that we do a candlelight service on Christmas Eve, one of the reasons that's a thing is because light is a powerful symbol, right? Light is symbolic of a whole bunch of stuff. Even in, even in the Bible, light symbolizes many different things in different ways scripture passages. Um, one example is that light uh, is used to refer to God's holiness and his lack of sin, right? <clears throat> First John chapter 1 says that God is light and there is no darkness in him at all, right? He's holy. He's set apart from everything evil and sinful. Another uh, way that the Bible uses light is to, to give us this idea that God drives out fear like light, right? If you've ever been afraid of the dark, you know that the dark can be scary and you wonder what's out there, right? But uh, we get little glimpses like in Psalm 27, it says that God is our light, whom shall we fear, right? But there's another way that the Bible uses light uh, that we're going to really hone in on tonight. And it's probably something you've, if you've been around in church since your childhood, Sunday school, you, you know this passage. Um, the Bible tells us that light shows the way for us, and God's Word is like that. Psalm 119, 105 says that God's Word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, right? And so we're going to take a look tonight at how uh, the Christmas story gives us that kind of light, how the baby in the manger ends up lighting the path that all of us need to take. A lot of us are looking for the right way to live our lives. A lot of us want to know what is the right path. Um, we, we think like this all the time, right? What's the most humane way to live? Should I be vegetarian or vegan? Uh, what's the most environmentally conscious, conscious way to live, right? What path should I take? How do I make sure I'm on the right side of history? We ask questions like this. Or what's, uh, what's the most fit and healthy self-care lifestyle? How do, I, how do I know which way to go in the decisions I make? I want to ask tonight, what is it about Christmas that shows us the way? What is the way that Christmas reveals, the light that it gives to us? 
What does the birth of the baby in the manger, the first coming of Christ, have to say about how we live now? We're actually going to look tonight back at the first Christmas. We've been in a sermon series where we're going back and forth, Jesus' first coming and his second coming. Tonight, we're back at the first Christmas, when Almighty God became a helpless baby and set an incredible example for all of us. There is a a glorious and profound truth that's waiting for us in the manger tonight, if we would just see it. And I think we'll see that that truth can be a light to our days, a light to our paths, and Even better, that if we embrace it, we can be a light in this world as well. Let's take a look at Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. While they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. That's a familiar story, right? We've heard that all our lives. I want to invite you to kind of think about it tonight Try to, try to see it in a fresh way. Try to imagine it yourself. You can even close your eyes. I want, I want you to contemplate and picture the streets of the city. I want you to imagine the mother of Christ in early labor. Do you, do you remember early labor, what that was like with your first baby? How scary that was? Goodness. The mother of Jesus, Mary, in early labor. Do you feel the urgency? Can you imagine Joseph knocking on doors, turned away, each time they reach a new building, when he runs up to it, there's, there's a flutter of hope in Mary's heart thinking, okay, maybe this is the place that, that I'll be able to get down off this horrible smelly donkey and lay down on something comfortable and finally stop trying to hold this baby in until we find a place, right? Can you see Joseph panicked every time that he gets turned away? There's no room. We don't have anywhere. Can you see him knocking? Can you see him kind of getting a little feisty with people? No, no, no. You don't understand. My wife is in labor. We need a put. Please let us in. Just to be turned away and have to hurry down the road. There was no room for God. No room for the Almighty other than a manger. By the way, that, that word manger in, in the Greek, in the New Testament, it's fatne. Pastor Paul can tell me I pronounced it wrong tomorrow. It's fatne. Uh, and that word could mean a stall where an animal is fed, or it could even mean uh, a, like a, a feeding trough where an animal is fed. Our English word manger actually shares roots with the Latin and Italian versions of this word. So if you're Italian in this room, you know what I'm about to say. If you've ever sat at an older Italian woman's dinner table and she said, manja, manja, that's that word. It's eat, eat, right? And you will hear that 37 times at her table because that's how Italians roll, right? All of that to say, God Almighty had nowhere to go Nowhere to be placed, nowhere to be born, aside from an animal's feeding stall or trough. There was nowhere better for him. Could, like, is God just really bad at making reservations? Of course not, right? This is where we have to say, God must have chosen this. God has the resources to send his son anywhere to allow his son to come into the world in any fashion he would imagine. And yet God sovereignly, intentionally chooses this kind of entrance into the world. And I think it's because God is, with the very birth of Jesus, demonstrating his humility as a vital piece of the story of Christ and a vital thing he calls each and every one of us to. He came in humility. We're going to talk about that for the remainder of the time we have here tonight. Do you, remember, um, do you remember TV shows and movies from the 80s and 90s where a woman is giving birth? It's, I feel like uh, all of the shows and movies that I grew up watching as like an eight-year-old, nine-year-old, 11, 12, when I saw these movies, labor and having a baby was always the most comical 
uh, moment where everything goes wrong, right? It's, it's, like, it's like the family isn't expecting that the baby could show up, right? She's nine months pregnant, pregnant but who knew, right? The baby could come. And, and the people in the movie, it's like the baby starts coming. They weren't expecting it. Nothing is packed. Nobody knows where anything is. The husband doesn't know where the nearest hospital is. He's lost his car keys. They, they scramble and get everyone into the station wagon, and the children are rolling around with no seatbelts in the back, right? And the mom is like, turn here. And he's like, what? And they, they barely get there. When they get to the hospital, nobody's expecting them. The doctors didn't know that she was pregnant. Do you remember these films? That is so far from the truth, at least. You can tell me if that's how it happened in the 80s or 90s, but I know for sure that's not how it happens today. Oh my goodness. When we had our, when my wife and I were pregnant, when my wife was pregnant, when we were expecting our, our oldest daughter, Michaela, nothing could have been further from that. Everything was planned and detailed and scheduled. We had a go bag packed and ready at five months pregnancy. It was insane. We knew where we were going with our hospital. We knew the nearest three hospitals. When it was like two weeks to the due date, we stayed in the house. We didn't venture anywhere. We were ready to go at any moment. I knew Lama's stuff. I had read two books. Like, we were prepped. All of that to say, all of that to say, God did not make some mistake The birth of his son did not sneak up on him. This is his intentional plan, to send his son humbly into the world in a manger with no room for him. Why? What does that say to us 2,000 years later? What, What are we supposed to take away from this? I want you to turn your Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. Bingo? No way. Who? All right, way to go. He's on it. We're only like six, seven minutes in. Praise God. Yes. Was it praise? Was that the word? All right, I got to stop interacting. We'll never get out of here for our family events. Philippians 2, verse 3, let me read for you. The Apostle Paul says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. By taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. After Jesus' ministry on earth, his death and his resurrection, the Apostle Paul pens these words urging you, Christians, us, urging us to live humble lives, to live with humility in our hearts, to avoid living for ourselves and our own personal ambitions, to give up our own pride, to treat other people, get this, get this, to treat other people not as equals, but as more significant than our own selves. That's a tall task. To look after the needs and interests of others in addition to our own. But why does he urge Christians to live this way? Did you catch it? Why? Because this is the attitude and mindset of our Lord and Savior. This is the very attitude of God when he shows up as Christ. God demonstrates for us humility like no other. He tells us to have that mindset. Jesus is God Almighty, but he lived humbly. That starts with his birth. But it's a pattern for the entirety of his time on earth. Jesus made his life about serving others and obeying his Father. And he did that all the way to the cross. Yeah. (laughs) Jesus did that all the way to the cross. His obedience led him all the way to give and give and give until he had given his life for us. At the cross, Jesus took on himself the penalty and punishment for your sin, for my sin, 
And being God, here's the beauty, here's the beauty of what happens on Christmas. Here's the beauty of the incarnation. Because he was God, he was able to pay the penalty for our sins in full, but because he was human, he was fit to stand in our place as our representative. So that through faith in Jesus, God says, your penalty is paid in full. You can be forgiven. You can be right with God. Hallelujah. Merry Christmas. That's what Christmas is about. Amen? And so the Apostle Paul rolls all of that. The incarnation, that Jesus would empty himself, that he would come as a servant, that he would obey his Father all the way to the cross. Paul rolls all of that into one package one package deal of humility that we as Christians are called and inspired to imitate. So what does the baby in the manger have to do with lighting our path? Well, friends, I think his humility lights our path and shows our way. His humility tells us how we ought to live. His humbleness gives us an idea of where to go. On Monday night, while trying to get my daughter here for uh, Bible study on time, uh, we were terribly, uh, we didn't do that, we failed. But on our way here, there was a detour over on like 75, where, where 75, and 35, 75 and 355 meet, there was a detour. We had to turn, I'd never gone down this road, and we ended up so far in the middle of nowhere that I was joking with my kids that the Blair Witch lives out here. So we're driving, and it's so dark that I can't, I've got my headlights on, and I can't see where the road ends in front of me. Does the road turn? Is it, is it, I couldn't see even with headlights. We live in a world that is dark. That's what the Bible says, where, where humility and the love of God is a rare thing, where the norm is to look out for me and my own. I think we've all experienced that, right? The norm is often selfishness, self-promotion, self-interest. And every one of us in here, are, we're all guilty of that. I'm not saying everyone out there. No, it's all, all of us. We've, we all want what's best for me. And Jesus comes to turn us away from self, to turn us to serve one another and turn us to obey the Father. He shows the way of life. He shines light on the ground for us to see which way to live. In the text in Philippians, we see at least three pieces of Christ's humility displayed through his life on earth that we can model. He came in humility to empty himself, it says. To empty himself. And in so doing, Jesus is shining a light on how each of us is called to live. To empty ourselves. To recognize that it's not about me. It's not all about me. He came in humility to serve humanity, it says. He he came in the form of a servant. And once we empty ourselves, we too can start looking to the needs of those around us to genuinely, selflessly care for our neighbors, for our co-workers, for our families, recognizing that we are each here, not, not just for me, but to serve. And Christmas is good at this, isn't it? And I hope, parents, you're, you're coaching your kids to, to every year get a, little, get a little less joy out of the presents for me and a little more joy in giving, a little more joy in blessing someone else, right? Right? When they're little kids, it's hard to do. But as they mature, as they grow, coach them in that. This isn't just about you. How can you make someone else happy at Christmas? And he came in humility to obey his father, we're told. Part of the light that Jesus shines on the path for us to follow is that we were made to obey God. We were made to obey the Father. Obedience to Him, not just, and not just when it's easy, right? Because that's hardly obedience. I, I joke with my kids a lot that it's not obedience when I say, let's all go outside and play, and they go, woo, and come with me. That's not obedience. They wanted to do that. It's obedience when I say, let's spend two hours doing chores, and they say, okay, Dad, that's obedience. We're called to obey God when it's difficult, when it's not what we want to do. And for Christ, that meant going to the cross and suffering in church. He did that for us. Jesus demonstrates at the cross that obedience when it's hard is is not only what we were made for, but it, it is also the most glorious, inspiring, beautiful, and rewarding path. Because Jesus obeyed all the way to death, we are saved. Praise God. Hallelujah for his salvation. At Christmas, we marvel at the humility of Almighty God himself, that he would lower himself, 
be born in a manger, have no room at the inn, that he would empty himself, that he would come to serve rather than be served, that he would obey even in the face of death, and that humility is a light to us, guiding us to the way you and I are called to live, not for me, but in service to others, not for me, but in obedience to God, and then watching God do glorious things with all, all of that. And as we do that, I want to show you one more place. Look at Matthew 5, 14 to 16 as we close. Matthew 5, verses 14 through 16, they say this. Jesus is speaking. He says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. For those of us that put our trust in Jesus, who believe in his name and are saved by his blood, we are called to a new life. We are called to be the light of the world, to follow Jesus and his example, and to do good things for the people and the world around us. And when we do, Jesus says he shines through us, the very light of God, through us to this world. The last thing I want to share with you is this, that when we live out the humility of Christ, we can be the light of the world. When we live out the humility of Christ. Um, Ushers, would you make your way forward? They're going to help me uh, lighting some candles and not that one. That's not the one. Uh, We'll light some candles. Dave, would you bring the lighter up here? And once we get a little bit in, let's uh, dim the lights. We'll see who's afraid of the dark. All right. So, uh, okay, the demonstration. I won't tip mine. Dave will tip his. Look at that. It didn't work. It worked. All right, let's start dimming the lights. As we hold these candles, I want you to remember again that you are the church. You are the children of God. You are his representatives and ambassadors in this world. His light shining in the dark comes through his people. God's plan to bring more people to know him, more people to forgiveness, more people to salvation, God's plan is to do that through the light of Jesus shining through you as you follow his example of humility and as you tell people about the good news that is found in him. To be that light, church, we need to be the kind of Christians who empty ourselves who put aside our selfish ambitions and come together for the sake of God's kingdom so we imitate our humble Christ. One way that we can be the light is to, is to support those who take the gospel all over the world. We do that through our donations, often through the IMB. Many of you have gone on mission trips. Many of you support those who are doing that amazing work. Every year, It's our tradition to give a a financial love offering to the Lottie Moon Christmas offering. And I want to invite you to to do that tonight. On your way out, we'll have the offering box over there. You can place your offering as you go, or you can give a financial gift online. Because the world needs light. The world needs the light of Jesus. But it also needs that light here. Your coworkers need the light of Jesus. Your families need the light of Jesus. We need to be servants in this place, loving and serving new folks who walk through these doors. That's on us to show them Jesus. We need to give sacrificially to the causes of God in our community. That's on us 
to love people in Jesus' name because we're the light. We need to be the kind of business owners that stand in integrity. We need to be the kind of workers that garner trust from everyone we work with. We need to be the kind of husbands who give and give of ourselves to protect and provide for our families. We need to be the kind of wives who give and give of ourselves to care for and nurture our families. We need to be the kind of young adults who spend their youth and energy not just going around trying to have fun, but spending their youth and energy to bless the people and work and world around them. At Christmas 2,000 years ago, God sent his son into the world, a light in the darkness, to empty himself, to serve, and to obey the Father. And Christian, look at that candle. It is your turn now. You are the light of the world. Take all of that stuff. Ponder it. Meditate on it. Rejoice that God sent his son to save you and take serious the call to shine his light today. Merry Christmas, everyone. Pastor Paul is going to lead us in a, a song to close. Let's sing together. Silent night, holy night, all is cold. so tender and mild. Sleep in heavenly peace. Sleep in heavenly peace. So Friends, I hope you have a great time with your family this evening and tomorrow. Remember what Christmas is about. God sent his son to serve us, to save us, to die for us, and to give us new life so that we, so that we can follow after him. So let's do that. And I will see you all back here at 10 a.m., right? All of you? <laughs> will all? No? Some of you maybe not? That's all right. We'll be here at 10 a.m., one service tomorrow morning. The kids will be uh, up here with us and they'll have another praise pack to keep them entertained and we'll, we'll hear about bingo again tomorrow. Let me pray for you and then you're dismissed. God, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for Jesus, our only hope. Thank you that in this dark world, in the midst of our own sin, you sent a light to save us. Thank you for your son. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the resurrection. And God, help us Help us to celebrate well as families and with our friends and help us to be the light of the world. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed, everyone. Merry Christmas. And bingo.